All right. Well, we are carrying on in our Acts series. We've taken a couple of uh, weeks off from it. Of course, we were in Bulgaria, and then last week we gave you a bit of an update. So jumping back into it, this will sort of be our pattern with Acts, probably almost all the way till Easter, where we're in it for a little bit, and then we'll come out of it for a little bit, and then get back in it. Uh, so I think this is week five. Maybe it's week six. I don't quite remember, but I'm going to begin with asking you this question. Have you ever found it hard to receive a gift? And, you know, I'm not like talking about like those interesting gifts that we all got from our grandmas along the way that they're so happy to give us. And we're a little bit uncomfortable to have to like wear that thing or whatever. Right. I'm not talking about those types of gifts. I'm talking about gifts that we genuinely appreciate. I know I've struggled to receive people's generosity and their gifts, sometimes with clumsiness and awkwardness. Often we, we thank somebody for the gift and we also offer a, oh, you shouldn't have at the same time. Or we ask the giver uh, of the gift if they're sure, which is always like one of my favorite, like as if they accidentally wrapped it and wrote our name on it and they didn't mean to, right? Are you sure about this? Well, yeah, like I took 30 minutes to get it ready. Um, we've all likely tried to pay for a meal that someone has said from the beginning, I'm going to pay for this. This one's on me. And then at the end, we still say, oh, no, 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 let me, as if, uh, you know, not to look cheap, I think most of the time, but I think sometimes because we genuinely are uncomfortable with having somebody bless us and pay for that. I don't uh, quite understand all the psychology behind our awkwardness and clumsiness with receiving gifts. I just know it's common. Maybe it's a Western thing, maybe it's a Canadian thing, I'm not sure, but we wrestle with it. In the first book of, uh, sorry, in the first chapter of the book of James, the apostle states that every good and perfect gift is from above. And that in and of itself probably could give us a whole lot to think about. Every good and perfect gift is from above. What do you mean? I work for this. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. It seems reasonable that if we are prone to feel awkward when other humans give us gifts, then we are certainly going to misunderstand God's gifts from time to time. In fact, we're all probably um, easily able to come up with ways in which all of us have wrestled with God's perfect gifts given to us. Uh, if you consider at one time or another, we probably have uncomfortably and awkwardly and clumsily accepted things like salvation, grace, mercy, a calling, a commissioning, and even the Holy Spirit. And these are, of course, general Christian gifts that we're all, you know, uh, equally uh, recipients of. But then there's these like unique gifts of God that he drops into all of our lives. Uh, people have, have at times wrestled with like their worthiness of their spouse. That why would God give me that person? I'm such a mess. Or our job. Or even, even to be a father or a mother to our children. Why would God give me this gift? I'm not deserving of this. I'm not fit for this. All things are gifts of God. All of these good and perfect things are gifts of God from heaven. And because they are gifts, it means that they cannot be earned or purchased. They only can be received. And so this morning as we move back into this act series, we're going to talk about receiving God's gifts, how we tend to get it wrong, and how we get it right. Our text this morning will be from the 8th chapter of Acts, beginning in verse 9 through 25. I'll briefly comment on the earlier part of the chapter to get us going, but that will be our main text for this morning. All right, so some background on Acts 8. So the 8th chapter of Acts, I think, sort of is in an awkward spot where it gets lost between Acts 7 and Acts 9. So Acts 7 is the organization of the church. It's where we see deacons uh, 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 called and commissioned into their ministry uh, and, and the apostles getting in their lane and sticking to teaching and prayer. And then we also see Stephen before the Sanhedrin, and, and he's defending the gospel, and he's, and he's promoting Jesus, and he's telling all of these accusers that they're wrong, and then they kill him. And he becomes the first Christian martyr. 
And then, of course, Acts chapter 9, where we're going to go next week, is the dramatic encounter of Paul and Jesus himself on the road to Damascus, where this Pharisee, this, this, this genius, this absolute all-star of the law, has his entire world turned upside down, literally. Those are very significant chapters in the book of Acts, and they're probably reasonably familiar to any of us who spent some amount of time in the book of Acts. We could probably even describe, at least sort of from memory, what's in those chapters, if asked to do so. Chapter 8 is not so much like that. Acts 8 is probably not on your list of favorite chapters in the Bible. If I were to say by memory, tell me what's in Acts 8, probably most of us don't know. Yet, it's a pretty noteworthy chapter. And it's one of these little transition chapters where something pretty significant is happening, but we don't always catch it. And so in chapter 8, what we see happening is now the church has been scattered from Jerusalem due to persecution. Because of the martyr of Stephen and this dude named Paul, who starts, at this time his name Saul still, starts breathing murderous threats and tracking down women and families and putting them in prison for believing in Jesus. The church is scattered and the Christians run, which seems to be a problem. However, that persecution was the spark that the church needed to do as Jesus commanded and take the gospel out of Jerusalem and to Samaria and to the very ends of the earth. And so Luke tells us in verses 5 through 8 of chapter 8, that Philip, one of the apostles, went down to a city in Samaria, and he proclaimed the Messiah there. And when the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs that he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Now it's hard for us to probably fully understand the boldness the Apostle Philip required to preach the gospel to Samaritans. Uh, these two groups, Jews and Samaritans, really didn't like each other. And at the time of the gospel's arrival in Samaria, there had been hostility between Jews and Samaritans for 1,000 years. That is a long grudge. Generational hatred, like son and daughter after son and daughter after son and daughter, hating one another just the way their forefathers and foremothers had. The Samaritans were despised by the Jews. They were considered to be hybrids in both race and religion, half-breeds as far as race and religion, and they were considered to be heretics and divisive as far as community and relationship. The Apostle John summed up the situation between Jews and Samaritans in the famous story of the woman at the well in John 4. He makes this simple statement where he interjects like a little side note to what Jesus is saying. And John says, Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Pretty, pretty straightforward. And so remarkably, that hostility doesn't stop Philip. And he goes to a Samaritan city. And in that Samaritan city, he has great success in preaching the gospel to people that had for so long been enemies. And so Luke records this with almost like excited detail. Like I think you can tell that Luke is excited to be telling the world that the Samaritans are receiving the gospel and Jews took it to them and there's some restoration of relationship here. But as we see time and time again in Acts, this doesn't mean there weren't also struggles. Acts is this amazing book where we see these amazing things happen, and then we see struggle emerge, which is why it's always silly to say, let's just get back to the Acts church, because the Acts church actually looks quite a bit like us. They do a lot well, and then they make a ton of mistakes. <laughs> so chapter 8 is then this account of a large-scale revival, we could say, but then it's also a story about a single person, which is where we're going to go. And it's about a single person who saw a gift of God as something that could be bought. So we're going to start in verse 9, read through verse 25. For some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is rightly called the great power of God. 
They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. And when they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They'd simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, pray to the Lord for me that nothing you have said may happen to me. After they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. So Luke tells us that among the Samaritan converts is this sorcerer named Simon. And Simon just doesn't really get it. He wants to buy a miraculous ministry. And the reason why Simon wants to buy this ministry is really found by putting together the details of his story. And so this is what Luke tells us about Simon. In verse 9, Luke says that Simon amazed all the people of Samaria and that he boasted that he was someone great. Verse 10, Luke says that all the people, both high and low, the esteemed and the not esteemed, everyone gave him their attention. And they exclaimed, the man is rightly called the power of God. Verse 11, Luke says that they followed him. And that's not just like physically. That's listening to what he has to say. Students, because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. So you see, prior to the Samaritans hearing about and receiving Jesus as their Savior and as their Lord, Simon the sorcerer was the divine guru in town. And he was capable of signs and wonders. Simon was the one who commanded attention. He was the one who caused amazement. He was esteemed and he was followed. But when Philip the Apostle arrives, that changes. Verse 5 says that Philip proclaimed the Messiah. And when the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. Instead of being amazed at now what Simon did through magic, they are amazed on account of the miracles that Philip is performing. Instead of acknowledging Simon's claim to divine power, they believe in the message about Jesus the Messiah and the kingdom of God. And the power of the Holy Spirit working through Philip, captures their attention. And so before Jesus was preached, Simon's important. Simon is esteemed. Simon has control in the community. And so even though Simon comes to belief in Jesus, and he gains the gift of eternal life, the arrival of the gospel and its power has caused Simon to lose personal significance in the community. And this loss leads him to make a very wrong conclusion. Which brings us to our first point. That acceptance of the gospel doesn't prevent terrible conclusions. Verse 13 and then 18 to 19. Simon himself believed and was baptized and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. Fantastic. He believed and was baptized. Tremendous. That's what we want. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by everything he's seeing. Then verse 18 and 19, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Simon's story is 
a sample of belief and terrible conclusions occupying the same person. And it's a real clear warning that coming to faith does not mean we are somehow immune from coming to really poor conclusions about God and all of the life that is found in him. In fact, some of the worst thinkers that I am aware of claim to be Christians. So Simon's an example, but he's not the exception. Uh, for a couple of years, I worked at a faith-based uh, rehabilitation facility for men. And something that I witnessed take place time and time again was men would come in and they would, they would be so broken and so lost and so desperate and then they would come to faith in Christ and then they would start to heal. They would start to recover. Their minds would get a little clearer. They'd get off the drugs and the toxic you know, effects of it would start to leave their system. And they've accepted Jesus. And then they would decide that they should leave the program before finishing it because they're good now. And their acceptance of the gospel then didn't prevent terrible conclusions about the hard work required that Jesus still needed to do to help them conquer those addictions. Just because they said the sinner's prayer didn't mean they weren't still addicts. Likewise, Simon the sorcerer's acceptance of the gospel doesn't prevent him from making terrible conclusions. And he believed he could purchase the gift of God. Specifically, the ministry he saw taking place in Peter and John, was, which was this ministry of acting as a conduit for the Holy Spirit to transfer as they prayed and laid their hands on people. And I want to make sure that I say this. Don't discount Simon's conversion. Like, Don't sit there and go, well, maybe he didn't really believe. Exactly. <laughs> Luke makes no statement that he was only half in. Simon's conversion was genuine. He believed. He's baptized. He follows Philip, and he's trying to learn. But when Peter and John show up and pray for the Holy Spirit, Simon sees it as something now to do what? Regain his status and regain his influence. It's amazing that we would forfeit the gifts of God because we think that the old life was still maybe better. The Holy Spirit was seen by Simon as tricks to add to his bag of, of, of magic so that he could once again capture the attention of the people who'd seen something better. And he concluded that this ministry must be able to be purchased. So he asked Peter and John to buy it. And you know, the verb translated as offered money in verse 18, it actually implies that Simon brought money, like placed it at the apostles' feet. Like, there it is. Like, dollar bills right in front of them. Um, not like, hey, I've got money at home that I can go get if you can give me this gift. Like, look, I've got it right now. Give me the gift, and this is yours in this moment. Simon believed the gospel. But he also believed he could buy the ability to share the gift of the Holy Spirit. And to this day, Simon's story, about a very bad conclusion, lives on in the term simony. Simony being the attempt to turn the spiritual into the commercial, to peddle the things of God, and committing the serious sin of believing you can buy church office. Simon, the former expert in the magical arts, is presented as both believing in the gospel and committing a serious sin. All in one story. All because he makes a terrible conclusion. Now, I don't expect that anybody here this morning has tried to buy the, the, the gift of, of Holy Spirit conduitness. <laughs> but that doesn't mean we haven't made some terrible conclusions about God or the things of God after conversion. I certainly have. I've talked to enough of you to know some of you have at times, because you've told me so. <laughs> so there are the big, bad, general conclusions, like now my life will be easy because I accepted Jesus. Or serving God now means that he'll serve me because he owes me. Or God's goodness is only experienced in peace and tranquility. God would never show me his goodness when life is hard. Or I can do whatever I want because I accepted Jesus and God's holiness is no longer offended by my sin. Or the Old Testament isn't relevant. I'm a New Testament guy. And then there's the very personal and specific conclusions that we make after receiving the gospel. Conclusions about how maybe it makes us more significant than we should feel. 
or that somehow it gives a different flavor to what we do with our money or our time or even if we should attend church or not attend church. And the practical reminder from this detail in Simon's account is that living the whole story of the gospel means we must always be on the lookout, aware, discerning, sensitive to the terrible conclusions that we may be making about life and faith and God, even while we believe. Belief doesn't insulate us from very bad thinking. Um, If you don't believe me, just get on the podcasts and listen to some Christian deconstructionists. Horrendous thinking, terrible thinking, and professing Christians all at the same time. Being saved doesn't mean that terrible ideas don't make their way into our hearts and then into our practice. The next lesson in Simon's story is that discipleship then requires a repentant reordering of priorities and desires. I was thinking today how many times I've said this to you over seven plus years with you because it's so, it's so needed in our lives. It, it, like This is a constant challenge for me. And so this must be a constant challenge for you because I don't think I'm the only one. A repentant reordering of priorities and desires. Acts 20 to 22, Peter answered, may your money perish with you because you thought. Sometimes we think terribly. You could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry. Because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. Terrible thinking. Terrible conclusions. Peter speaks to Simon um, in a far different way than I think we usually do when we are presented with somebody's sin or even our own, um, he publicly and outspokenly rebukes them. Peter speaks of perishing in the language of the Old Testament, which uh, was what happened to those who rebelled against God. They perished. And I think you would agree that Peter's rebuke doesn't suggest that the apostles felt that Simon's request to buy God's gift was like a little oopsie-whoopsie sin which is the way we mostly see sin today. Peter rebukes firmly, and he speaks of God's judgment about sin. We often see sin um, and speak of sin as if God sees our sin the way a proud parent views it when the toddler writes with crayons on the wall. Ah, annoying, but no big deal. It'll come off. Kind of cute. Peter says Simon's conclusion is a serious problem. It's a sin error, and sin is never not a big deal. It leads to destruction. And furthermore, Peter says Simon can have no part in the ministry. No part in this ministry with a a heart like he currently has. And make sure you notice that Simon's heart doesn't disqualify him from ministry because he offended the apostles. Peter says he's disqualified because his heart is not right before God. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what I think or what you think. What matters is what God's seeing in our own hearts. Which really brings us to the main meat of this point. That the only way forward for Simon is a repentant reordering of desires and priorities. Verse 22, repent of this wickedness. And pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. Yes, bad thinking's a problem. Simon needed to learn a heart with wrong priorities and desires before God disqualifies from people, disqualifies people from living the whole story. A harder sinful heart is not overlooked by God. And remember church, Simon believed the gospel. The heart problem is still there after conversion. His priorities and desires are still in need of renewal after conversion, which should give us all a bit of pause in order to consider what conclusions we might need to adjust. Maybe you're contributing to a heart problem in us. And not for the purpose of being hard or critical on ourselves, you know, for some religious reason. 
but to ensure our hearts are in the right place before a God who sees them. You remember in Psalm 51, David, after committing adultery and orchestrating murder, two pretty bad ideas, says to God, against only you have I sinned. That's a pretty powerful statement. Because he just stole somebody's wife and then killed them. And he's saying, but ultimately, God, it's between me and you. And what you see, you cannot be pleased with. Against you have I sinned. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit in me. David knew that he could do everything he could externally to say sorry. But at the end of the day, his heart had to be right before God. David, like Simon and us, had to ensure that his priorities and his passions and his values were coming into alignment with God's, not his own. And I mean, if there is a moment where we see somebody in pursuit of their own kingdom against God's, it is certainly King David. You see, living fully in the gospel story as a disciple cannot happen without a repentant reordering of priorities and desires. And we should also take pause and examine ourselves because Simon's response to Peter's rebuke shows us that hearing the warning doesn't equal repentance. In fact, Simon shows no sign of repentance or even remorse. Instead of praying for forgiveness as Peter urges him to do, verse 22, Simon says, would you pray for me? What really concerned Simon was not that he might receive God's forgiveness, but that he might escape God's judgment. That's a big difference. I don't want to go to hell. Well, you offended God. Well, that doesn't matter, does it? I just don't want to go to hell. It seems to me that if we worry a whole lot more about if we've offended God, hell and heaven will take care of themselves. Simon wasn't upset he sinned. He was upset he got caught. It's a big difference. Further proving that he has no real interest in reordering his life into alignment with Jesus and his kingdom. He was glad to not go to hell. He liked some of the magic he was seeing, but he wasn't going to change what was going on in here. He simply wanted the benefits and the perks of membership in some new group. Now, again, I don't suspect anyone here has tried to purchase participation in God's work with money. But I do suspect we've tithed or withheld tithe when the church or the pastor isn't meeting our expectations somehow believing that God gave us the right to be arbitrators or judges of his tithe. I do suspect we are aware of people who've given money to a Christian cause because it gives them a stake in it, like shareholders. And now we can have a say in how things are done. The donations ultimately for personal gain. I do suspect we've served or not served based on what's in it for us. I do suspect we've served on boards or leadership teams so we can get our way and gain control rather than serve or support a congregation or even a pastor. And I do suspect we've turned a blind eye to sin, but still desire to be seen as valued and important as a leader in our church family. And the point is we all have preferences and we all have values and we all have priorities that are so strong in all of us, all of us. And unless those things become reordered with genuine repentance, which is a turning away from, it's not just a, yeah, I shouldn't have done that, but I'm going to keep it in my back pocket. It's a turning away. It's a moving away. It's a walking away to something different. And discipleship, as much as it is about accepting salvation, it requires repentance and reordering of priorities and desires time and time and time again. Not once at the beginning and set for life, but over and over and over again. It requires checking our hearts and checking our motives. It requires considering if God's gifts and his kingdom are received as such. Or if they are seen as rewards and commodities for the spiritually well-to-do. So as we bring this rather simple message to a close, 
and prepare our hearts for communion. First of all, as we come to this table, let's remember that God is so generous. I mean, what would our lives look like if we really believed fully that every good and perfect gift comes from God? And that he doesn't change. That he wasn't just generous for your parents or your grandparents. He wasn't just generous for the church and acts. He wasn't just generous during the Reformation. That he's as generous with us as he was with those who came before us. He's not like shadows that come and go, flicker. He's consistent and present and generous perfectly, consistently, faithfully all the time. He is constantly, regularly, consistently gifting his people. And that is very good news because we are all beggars. We've all found ourselves ha asking, how can we receive the gift of God? We've all been Simon. Can I give you money for it? Can I pay you for it? Can I earn it? Somehow, God, can I take that gift from you? by somehow in my own strength being deserving or qualified? And the answer for us is the same as it was for Simon. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. You can't win it. You can't accomplish it. But you can freely receive it. And the way we receive it is with sincere repentance. Letting go of bad conclusions and selfish interests. You know, Jesus said that if we want to gain his life, we have to lose our own. Simon didn't want to lose his life. We receive it by falling on the faithful forgiveness of God who gives to sinners undeserving. And so as we come to the table this morning, may we remember that this salvation is a gift. There is not a person who will walk to this table who is deserving to be here. And yet we're all called and welcomed. But God does ask as we take him into ourselves that we give him all of ourselves in return. So let's come again as a community to the table and receive rather than purchase. There's no debit machine up here for your communion today. Come up here and receive rather than win. Come up here and receive rather than otherwise attain God's gift of grace. A gift that is as free as it is good and as it is perfect.